Welcome to Power Boat Talk, the podcast where we talk everything performance boats with your host, Joe Rode. Uh, hello, welcome to Power Boat Talk. So today I'm here with uh, probably one of the coolest guys in Southern California because of his, uh, because of what he does and the company he works for. I'm here with Stan Marikami. Stan is the VP of Shot of Boats, but he's the guy that puts them together, designs them, rigs them. He's kind of the, the it guy at Shada. And, uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with Shada on the West Coast, I know the, the lore has gotten out around the country, but on the West Coast, it's about the coolest river cruiser racer that you, you can, you can uh, find. So uh, Stan, thanks for coming on and uh, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Joe. Um, I appreciate it. Stan and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, through the years, I sold him both parts for years and years and always just kept up with what he was up to. And uh, when I was speed skiing, I got pretty familiar with Shot of Boats, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan too. You know, it's one of those someday toys that we'd all like to have. But uh, so anyhow, Stan, so let's tell us. I mean, Shot is going strong. Uh, what's what's new and exciting at Shot? What's going on over there right now? You know, we're, we're extremely busy. We're backed up. Um, even with COVID, we worked all the way through COVID, so it didn't stop us. We were there at the shop working. But um, we still run a really heavy backlog. You know, our backbone is, is V-drives, 21s, 22s, and 24s. They're extremely labor intense. So we get them backed up pretty, pretty far back. Um, build time approximately on a V-drive is 18 months. Uh, and everything's new. I do everything new. Um, I rarely work on 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 used stuff. Not saying that I I don't, but um, we're usually pretty backed up working on new stuff. My my thing alone. I do all the rigging, hundred percent. So the way Shiata works is, Lee Spindler and I are partners. Um, we go way back. Lee and I grew up together, basically at the shop. Um, Lee takes care of the glass shop and the upholstery shop, and I take care of all the reading. So anything that comes to me is a bear hole that I put together. So to give you some background history, <laughs> we're going to go pretty far back. Um, when Ron Spindler took over the company from Leonard Shiat, it was back in about 1979. Leonard had his second heart attack and was in the hospital. Um, Ron previously wanted to buy the company, and Leonard wasn't ready. But after the second heart attack, there was kind of a lot of writing on the wall. So they had Ron come in, and they finalized a deal to buy the company in 1978-79. Um, right after Ron got the company, I came to work for the company. And the way I was 17 at the time, um, the way... I got into the company was this, uh, actually my girlfriend at the time worked down the street. So I would take her to work and I drove by the shop and I walked in and there's a guy that was running the shop at the time was named Bert Hart. Um, his dad owned Hartcraft, which was a big cruiser company, whole background in, in boating. Um, he said, come back tomorrow. I need to talk to the owner. So, and then I would come back the next day and because I had to drop off my girlfriend at the time. So Bert would say, come back tomorrow. So this went on for about a week. So finally, they just, they hired me. At that time, minimum wage was, I think, $3.15 an hour. That's how far back we go. And yeah. I said, sure, I'll take it. So at that time, the company, my first year when we worked there, and I still remember this, we built, which people are going to go, there's no way, but we had... Bert was rigging in the shop, a guy named uh, Dennis Markley, um, a guy named Scott Trevett. Uh, they were rigging, there were three time full riggers in the shop. We had a guy named Jeff Shear that was helping out in the office, um, and a gal named Marion that was running the office. We had four or five guys in the glass shop. This was in the Gardena facility. So I, I still remember the first year. We built 56 boats the first year I was there. 
uh, 36 of them, 36 were complete V-drives. But at that time, the boats were, were LS6s, you know, 420 horsepower maybe. Uh, a couple ski race boats in there. Um, at that time, Vince Granatelli was building motors for us, and Andy Granatelli. Mm. Um, they were building turbo motors for us, and Bob Teague at that time was running a Grand National boat that was built by us that he inquired the mold and we were laying up boats for him. So that's the first time I met Bob. Um, throughout the years, as the, as the years went on, um, you know, within the first year, I was already in the boats and they were having me do things. And, and at that time, we had industrial arts in the school. So we had metal shop, wood shop, you know, we had mechanical drafting. We had everything that that gave me the, the tools, what I use today. Oh, to you, you went through, you went through that stuff. You took advantage of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In high school, you know, I wasn't, yeah. I didn't want to go really off to college. I, I was a worker, you know, a blue collar guy, man. I like working. I don't like the office stuff. As a couple of years went on, um, Dennis actually, you know, Scott left, Dennis left, um, Dennis retired. Um, uh, we, we still had guys in there rigging. Um, I was slowly, you know, taking over the rigging shop at that time. They taught me all the different things on V drives and what to do. So when we go back to that time, we had strut placements in a certain area. We had rudders in a certain area. Uh, cab plates were a certain length. Uh, the V drives, all Casale V drives, um, they were always in the same place. So we never had a thousand horsepower at that time we were always in the low 600s so we didn't have to build the boats like we did now they're very simple no. single cable steering um the z stock that we have that people you know where we where we got that um we designed that actually ron designed the z stock explain what the z stock is our z stock is our motor rails it sits on top of the stringer goes down like a piece of angle and then comes back out. So the motor plates sit on this, this rail. So instead of using angle, we help utilize the top of the stringer to support the motors that we do. So that was, we paid for the die. And at that time, Lee was going to school with the owner son of, of Kaiser Steel, Kaiser Aluminum. So that gave the in uh, to have the Z stock made. So when people yeah. go, Oh, I, we could find this stuff, you know, if people that know our boats know what Z stock. And is. I remember through the years yeah. when you guys came out with that, I remember buying it and selling it to people and it was, that yeah, was really cool. The extrusion. It, it, so it, it, and now it's just so expensive that, you know, we have enough probably to, to last us until I retire, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then everybody's going back to aluminum angle. Um, so, so when you first started then, when Ron got the company, so did it, did it have the complete line? I mean, did you have the twenties and the 21s and, and what did he yeah, have? We had, we had the, we had the 20, the 21, we had the 22, uh, and then we had a 30 and through the years we developed a 20, a 26 and a 27 that we never really, we never marketed. We built a couple of them mm -hmm. for like ourselves and. Then they just sat there. We never really, there's one running around that Gary Teague um, put together. That is really a nice piece um, owned by a guy named Darren Welter. And that was, there's not two, there's only two of them out there. But then the, the 24 came back into our line. Leonard designed, God, he had a couple different style 21s, a couple different style 22s. Uh, we had a couple different style 20s. Um, then we started making them for outboards, so we put a well in them, uh, which we built. I mean, we built a dozen or so of them, and then we it was easier to build uh, without the well. Um, but the mainstay was was V drives. It was all, always Not V drives? Until, yeah, we built V drives from, you know, our mainstay of V drives were basically up until about 1992 
So we built very little outdrives at that time. The ones that we did build had TRS drives. If you remember the old TRS drives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, worked good in a 22, did not work good in a 21. Uh, the 21s don't have the transom height that we need for X dimensions. So our mainstay, my, my specialty was V drives, building V drives. So at that time we were heavily into ski racing and we were how, do, getting, how do you think that? How do you think that happened? Uh, Ron to, to be it. known as Sickle Ski <laughs> Race Boat. We were we were always good. We had guys um, like Billy Dunsmore, Billy Dunsmore Senior, Billy Dunsmore Senior. Uh, it was another one like Casale and everybody else. He's he's an older gentleman that uh, knows more about V drives than than most will ever know. Uh, Billy took on that trait. We also had guys like Mike King, which is still in the business, um, building real nice stuff out there with um, that came from Prime Marine, which actually came from Rex Marine, um, the history of, of him coming up the line. Mike built some really custom stuff, more custom stuff than we were doing in the early 80s and the mid-80s. Um, and then we had Gary Teague, which also was supplying that. And these were all from ski racers, from guys like Ron Tosarski, Bob Nixon, um, and so on down the line that were ski racing really heavily. And it was us against Hallett. And then Hallett came up with their, their Vector and their 210. And then that's when about mid eighties, when the outdrives came into effect, the big outdrives, the number fours and fives. So our thing was to about the mid eighties is when the horsepower started peaking up. That's when we started getting into the, a lot of the twin turbo motors. Uh, Bob Teague was building our motors at that time. He was working with our company um, heavily with me. He, he, Bob took me under his wing. I, I knew Bob since 1980, 1980 or so, but he would critique my rigging pretty fierce. Um, Bob? Bob? We're talking yeah. about the same Bob here? <laughs> there was, there was, you know... <laughs> Is as much as is, you know. I know a complete different side of Bob. Well, I know two different sides of Bob. One that could be, you know, you don't want to see. But one is yeah. is the guy has a big heart, and yeah, um, he does. He had the patience to to really teach me a lot. He was Grand National Racing at the time in the mid '80s. Got us into Grand National Racing as well. Um, we were ski racing. Ron was ski racing most of the time. Um, but when the Grand National boats didn't have enough boats to make a field, Bob would call us to come out and, and, and race. So we would bring 21s out, you know, turbo motors, 21. And we were told always to stay on the outside, which, <laughs> you know, which was good because with Tubble Fools and Bob racing, they would swap paint all the time. So I wanted no part of that, you know, so I'd run the outside of the course so they would have at least three, four boats in the field. Um, but Bob really took me under his wing and started explaining why we do things. And that's when the V drives in Shiata started to change. That's when we just started, you know, we started messing with strut placements and, mm. and V drive placements and rudder placements. The Just moving the rudder back to the, to as far against the transom as, as we could get mm. and starting to bump, you know, from 18 and a half inch strut placements, starting to bump them up to 20, 21, 22, you know, now we're, we're even, you know, farther up, um, made a huge difference in, in handling and performance. And we just didn't change it. We just, we took our boat, we would move the strut around to get, so we knew what was going on before we put it onto a customer's boat and started making them faster. We started, uh, playing with, rudder depths you know we went to the kilos we took a 21 to the kilos we wanted to find out mm. how many people how many ski racers had 100 mile an hour boats so we had a call out and powerboat magazine um said hey we're gonna have a kilo run and you bring all the ski race boats you can hallett bring all the ski race boats you can and we're gonna see whose boat really runs over 100 miles an hour and uh so we went out and to test ours, and we found out, ah, oh, we knew it was running in the upper 90s, and we said, well, let's cut an inch off the rudder and go run it again. Well, the boat picked up more speed. 
still turned, did everything. Okay, let's cut the rudder again. So we cut another inch off the rudder. Went out, ran, the boat still turned and did everything and was a little faster. So then by the time we cut the next, it was about a half inch off the rudder, the boat wouldn't turn anymore. <laughs> so we'd throw it in a turn, it wouldn't turn, and we'd go, okay, let's add, let's go back, get a new rudder, and, and, and add that half inch, and we'll go run the kilos. So the first year we went, oh, 101, 101 miles an hour. We had the fastest one. Ron Spindler in the kilos nope. went 101. Was that the 788 boat? The that was the 788 boat. Wasn't That's it a 22 we, or was it a 21? No, it was a 20. It was a 21. We had a 22 a 20. as well. So depending okay. on what ski races, if it was going to be a real rough water ski race, we'd bring the 22 oh. out. If okay. it was a smooth water race like in Parker, we'd bring the 21 out. So um, Bob was building motors at that time. We ended up leaving the Granatelli's and, and went to Bob. Um, the boat went 101 point like three or something like that uh and that was the fastest one and and it was it was great to hear all the excuses why you know all <laughs> these 100 mile an hour boats that that when you're you know when you're at the bar you know everybody's like i got a 100 mile an hour boat you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so the next year we did it again and uh we built a new boat which was another 788 boat uh so we had two of them we had a matching pair of of boat you couldn't tell them apart they were the same but you know, we moved the motor a little bit farther forward and we built this tonneau cover that went from the back seats to cover up the whole motor. And, and it was like a one piece back and you just seen two seats in the boat. Um, that boat went 103 and that was the, the fastest boat that year. So that's when we started breaking the hundred mile an hour mark it was in about the mid eighties and we were doing a lot of work about 87, 88. I think Bill Dunsmore, uh, junior and senior came out with an external rudder system and the external oh, rudder you know system. I remember that. Yeah, it was, it was a different design. There's some of them out there still people ask, Oh, what's better? The, the internal or external. Well, the external rudder, we built a box. I didn't build it. We copied it from the Dunsmores. You know, I'll, I'll say right off the top, you know, we, we took that and we, you know, we built one identical to theirs. They were the mainstay. They were the ones that, that, uh, had the, the idea to make these boats go faster and they built a couple with external boxes we copy the boxes so it's it's their credit um that put the blade in the water and took the shaft and lifted it up behind the boat so there was no drag factor hmm. you had to run a little bit deeper rudder but you had to drive the boat different so normally on a 21 when we come into a turn we'll plate down a tick and drop the nose, and, and the boat will come around. Um, that's what the the handling characteristics of the Shiata, and, and you know, as a bragging point, is second to none. I mean, they're like a slot car. You get them yeah, on, and, yeah. and it's like a high performance car that you're driving on a course. The thing just holds and runs. Well, we got the first external runner system, and ran it. The boat, you had to learn not to drop the nose. So when you went into a turn, you didn't drop the nose. If you drop the nose, and this comes down to finding out where you're at, it actually will lift the rudder out of the water because it's farther back. You're, you're down here. The mm -hmm. rudder's down here. Well, when you do this in a nose, it lifts it up, and the boat wouldn't turn. So you could actually surf the boat, you know, in a wake and, and, and lose the boat. So you had to learn to trust yourself and, and keep the back of the boat down and, and drive it hard. That the, ru the rudder situation, you have to figure that out on your own by testing or Billy let you know? Uh, Billy kind of let us know, but then yet we found if we did things a little bit different on lengths, we felt that we could get ours to handle a little bit different mm -hmm. in the way we wanted it. Um, Howard Haig, Paul and Todd Haig had an external rudder system on a second boat, extremely fast. Uh, most of them, we were trying to scrub mile an hour now because we were still in the area of horsepower. Um, they were they were about 1,000 horsepower. Twin turbo motors were 1,000 horsepower. The, nobody had these 1,500 horsepower turbo right. motors. Right. Um, well, everybody's, were, carbureted, everybody's still carbureted at the time, too. Yeah, right? we were still so, carbureted until yeah. Gentry came out with the EFI turbo system. Um, 
and he was running those in his offshore boat, and they weren't really coming into the ski race world, even though the Dunsmores, again, were working for Gentry. Uh, it, Billy Sr., Bill Sr., um, he's the one that I believe kind of was the mainstay and the developer of that system. Hmm. They did the race aero system. And yeah, then I they think took the race aero did, didn't Gent- I, thought, I thought, didn't Gentry just end up buying all the race aero stuff at some point? Or Yes, yes. And then after um, he, after his, his crash, the, the, the fatal crash in, in Key West at the World Championships, the, the shop sat dormant. It was right down the street from Shiata. And we would go over there when they were busy and help them ship motors out and stuff back and forth to the East Coast and and uh, give them a lot of support because they were giving us support in ski racing, the Gentries were. So after the accident um, in the skater where he rolled it over, uh, the company sat quiet. And through a couple years later, I don't know exactly how many years later, that's when Carson Brummett bought everything from them. All the, the boats, the motors, you know, container full of, of turbo parts and motors. Now, it, you know, at the time, getting off the shot out of subject, and you think of Gentry, I'd go over to Gentry's, and they had, in their warehouse, was huge. It was a 100,000 square foot warehouse. Yeah. And in the corner of their warehouse, they probably had 200 turbo motors and fuel injection motors oh my gosh, just no piled way. on top of each other. They would... After a race, they would pull all the motors out of the boat. They wouldn't rebuild them. They oh just took them over to the side on a forklift and uh-huh. knocked them over. They were like laying on the side of it, a full-on turbo motor laying on its side with another one sitting on top of it. And these motors were 10 high. Oh, my gosh. It, it, they're, they're, it was incredible. you know. But that's the money that he had. Yeah. So yeah. when... I would have loved just to have a couple of those motors. Yeah. You know, you're like, you're, you're volunteering. Can, can I, can I haul off some of your junk for you free of charge? Yeah. And at that time when we were buying motors and things from Bob, cause then we were, Bob T was building all our ski race motors, um, and our customer turbo motors. So you could come into the shop at that time in 1986. I'll go back to that. In 1986. I was, I was running the whole rigging shop. I was, doing everything now from late seventies to 86. I was on my own. I'm, I'm rigging. Uh, Bob and I are critiquing stuff and trying to make things go faster. Uh, we're building the boats heavier because of the fact that Mm. we're beyond the 600 horsepower. Now, now we're up to a thousand. We got to make, we got to get the boat caught up to the mile, to the horsepower. Now before the boats always exceeded the horsepower. Now we're starting to catch up. So at that time, uh, we're starting to do some changes and strut angles and things and, and making the boats faster. But at that time, you could come into Shiata, um in in the mid-80s and buy a turnkey 21-foot turbocharged Shiata for like $92,000 on a trailer. Compared to now, <laughs> nowadays, we're in the range of anywhere from four hundred to 500000 now the motors alone, the turbo motors were twenty five thousand dollars to get twin turbo race aero motors uh, carbureted from the time, and wow. an ARCA car turbo four hundred transmission and and uh, a Casale V drive um, put together, you know, and that yeah. that yeah. that that at that time that was a, that was a hot rod boat. I mean, yeah. everybody was like, "This is what you take out in the afternoon and you run, and yeah. you run it hard. You you didn't have to." you know, we run better in a two to three foot shop than any. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great part. Yeah. And not taking anything away from flat bottoms because flat bottoms are a lot of fun. I don't rig any flat bottoms. You know, I, I strictly, I'm a V drive guy. So flat bottoms that, that have their, their place of going, you know, zero to a hundred in a short amount of time. You know, we look at it. We're the, we're the NASCAR of that. We're not the drag guys. We're the distance guys. So, I pride on our stuff, like now, and even at the time, we accelerate from 65, where we're up and running, at 65 to 110 in 3.5 seconds. Wow. So we're, we're, we're getting it on, and it's um, in a two-foot shop, 
you know, it loves that chop. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they are kind of boring in glass water. You know, you, you go out there, you want to, you want to run. And, uh, that's where our statistics came. Yeah. I think the world, the world has just gotten to know that more and more through the years. Um, I just, in fact, I just, I just interviewed a guy, a guy named Andrew Games. He drives a cracker box and yeah, a flat bottom Andrew. guy. Yeah. You probably know him. And he's like, man, my shot is so Andrew much well. fun, man. Uh, you know, but, but they are, they, and I'll tell anybody having ridden them through the years, like it is the coolest, literally they'll, they'll do anything in the, any water, um, as fast as you want them. And, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty rad. So, but you know, one, one thing I would, so, so when you said you, was, you had, you started evolving, making the boats, you know, building mm -hmm. the boats better, heavier, did, did, are the bottoms still the way that Leonard built them? Cause that's what I'm always curious about. Cause man, it just, it just seems like they're so yeah. far, even, even, even Hallett, like I grew up a Hallett guy, um, you know, and ve vectors are great boats. Two tens are great boats, but like, you ask, everybody will still say that that last little bit, the shot is still just a little bit better yeah. handling boat. And so even though the newer, newer technology, and I don't know if you guys just kept up or if Leonard was just that far ahead of the game, it's interesting. But yeah, I want to hear about that. We we would love to have a seance and have Leonard come back and explain why he did things that he did. Because if you knew Leonard, um, you know, for the very, very short time that I ever got to be around him, uh, being around his brother, Chuck, and and being around Bert, who grew up with Leonard. Uh, Leonard was a perfectionist. So back in, you know, he was building boats, so oh God, into the 50s, and then into the 60s, and it was mostly uh, flat bottoms, GN, drag uh, racing. Ski racing was still flat bottoms. We didn't have cruisers. Well, people wanted... Um, a boat to handle the rougher water. So he actually came up with the 22. For, actually, it was the 24 was the first one. A boat called the Ringleader. Okay. Um, which yeah, I want to talk on. about that. Yeah, yeah. I think Mike King still has that one. Um, and then he came up with the 22, and the, he built a lot of 22s. Well, at that time, it's different from now. Everybody wants bigger boats. When he came out with the 22, everybody says, no, 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 we, we need a smaller boat. So about... 70 mid 70s um he came out with the 21 um and they started building 21s in in 76 77 well and then the 20 what he ended up doing is he took a 22 let me back up he took a 22 and he shortened it took took three inches off the the freeboard and shortened the transom a little bit same um, bottom yeah, same bottom, and he built the 21 off of that. So the 22 was a wood plug boat, the original, made the mold off of it, made a boat, cut it all apart, and made the 21. So after he did that, people wanted a smaller boat still. Um, so you had guys like Ronnie Wilson running this uh, K-Ron K -Ron. Yeah, and... and Billy Dunsmore, the same thing, senior and junior, and, and a, a whole other group down the line, they wanted smaller boats. So Leonard started building the 20 in 79, and that boat was being tooled. So he took a 21, like he did the 22, cut the freeboard off of it, cut some off the back, and made the 20. So what ended up happening is he never he never built the wood plugs. He started with one and would just cut it down and cut it down and cut it down and, and make the boats that he wanted out of it. So that's where the three mainstay came. They all have the same bottom. People go, oh no, they're all different. No, they have the same bottom. The 24 is a different bottom. It's 18 degree instead of a 15 degree bottom. And, and uh, you know, it has a, has a bigger nose on it. Whole, a whole different animal. Uh, compared to the, the 20s, the 21s, and 22s. But everybody swears up and down that, oh, they changed them, they did this. No, they did not. The one thing about the boat is if you measure the boat, the the chines are in different areas. The Not the chines, the strakes, I'm sorry. The strakes are in different areas. And off the keel of the boat, you measure one's a little like half inch farther out than the other, and, and they're longer. One's longer than the other on the other side, so it's not a mirror image. And knowing Leonard, you know, we could never figure out why he did that. And nobody ever, nobody knows why he changed the bottom, and he did stuff like that. We're like, 
well, why is this one longer than the other side? Also, the 20, start even from the 22, the 21, and the 20, one side of the boat is wider than the other. It's about a half inch. And everybody's like, you know, the guys that work on them, like when we take measurements off the boats, the hard part putting them together is you just can't bolt it on because you go, oh, there's this big gap over here, you know. So we have to fake a lot of things to the eye. The tape measures, the tape measure doesn't lie, but you got to make it appealing to the eye. Right, right. But you got to make it work. So you got to know where to shift it and cut it and, and add things and, and do things. Um, so the, so so the bottoms is, are the same though. You guys didn't mess with it. It's that's all crazy. The are the same. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it, what's awesome is you didn't get some guy that buys the com- buys the company and says, you know what, we got to make this stuff. This guy screwed it up. We got to make it all straight. <laughs> well, square it all up. Okay, so there's a guy, I believe his name is Gary Steele. Um, oh, yeah. He took one of our 21s over to Hallett, and that's where the vector came. Gary was, and, Gary was a Hallett guy from the minis. He's been, he was a Hallett guy forever. They rolled the boat over, and they took all the measurements off R21, and, and they, they built their vector from that. Now, the one thing they did is they straightened everything up. They only took the measurements off one side. Um, the first three that I know, I think it was two or three, uh, uh, boat was Goosebumps was one, um, with the name of it. Uh, they rolled those boats over in a turn. Hmm. So we were thinking, uh, what did they do different? You know, what, what, what was different about it? And what were, mm-hmm. you know, they just didn't handle as good as a 21. And the guys that were building them, like Gary... Teague and, and, and uh, Mike, Keegan, they knew their stuff. They knew it. They knew how to build boats. There's no ands, ifs, or buts, um, you know, that they were, what they were doing. It was all good stuff, you know, but we couldn't figure out why they didn't handle as good as a 21. And, and uh, you don't see them out there. They're not sought after. Um, so that's, you know, our, our mainstay was, was that. So we, Coming down to that, about 1986, I took over running the whole company. Uh, running the company and building the boats and, and designing and, and coming up with new stuff. Um, at that time, we were still ski racing, so we'd ski race a little bit. Um, I was, at that time, ski racing as well um, with Ron. Uh, if he couldn't make it and we had to go or somebody needed a ride, um, you know, I would jump in and do that. Same with Grand National Racing. So we, we kind of got our racing heritage in well before that, but my racing heritage, you know, came from there. Um, then we started building 30 foot boats. And our 30 um, is actually 31 feet. Uh, we started, Ron and I started running that in about 88, 1988. And that was APBA and Popra. So we had APBA on the East Coast, Popra on the West Coast. So we were racing Popra at that time. Um, at that time, also in offshore racing, back in the mid-80s, it wasn't a big circle race. Um, they were open cockpit, and we would run from Marina Del Rey to, at that time, I, I believe it was called Marineland in PV. Oh, yeah, PV, so yeah. From there would be a checkpoint there, so we'd run down the coast um, to Marine Land, from Marine Land over to Avalon, from Avalon, Avalon wow. back to Marina Del Rey. Um, the uh, the rum run was from Long Beach to Avalon, around Avalon, the whole island, back to you know like two harbors then, and from two harbors back to to uh, Long Beach, and the races were long. They were, we had a short course and a long course. So we had a 65 mile course, and we had a long course, which is usually called a 110 mile race. So they had two races going on at once. And we would run 21 V drives in it. And then Ron wanted to run with the bigger boats. So we built a bigger boat. Um, At that time, Ron already built one back in the 80s with uh, small block injected motors in it. And actually, crashed the boat in um, New Orleans. Uh, we had C-suite drives on it, and, and the tie bar broke, and the drive slapped together. And mm. you 
and when that happened, uh, the boat, ro- you know, barrel rolled over. That was in a race in New Orleans. In a, in a race, yeah. yeah. He, he was he was out there. The boat was extremely fast. It was out there, um, close to 100 mile an hour boat when they rolled it over. Um, they all got kind of hurt in it, but not anything life threatening. They they all got beat up in it, broken arm. Bert got Bert was in the boat. He got pitched through the side of the boat, blew the whole side of the boat out. Um, Ron's the only one that stayed in the boat. <laughs> he had uh, had nothing wrong with them. <laughs> the other Bert and the other guy that was in the boat are the ones that got hurt. But um, Ron decided to build another, you know, thirty one. And when we did it, we put the injected motors back in it with uh, number five drives, and the injected motors just weren't that fast. So we had that boat put to the side so because it, it, it wasn't competitive. So in the meantime, Ron decided to build a 36-foot cat, and, and it was the Shiata cat, and, and that, that was a failure. Um, <laughs> I, I totally forgot about that. Now, back real quick on the 31, did you guys ever sell any of those, or was it just strictly Ron's race boat? Uh, basically, we... He built a stock one that he sold with alpha drives in it. And then we had this one with number five drives on it. I think that boat, because there's a time in Shiata when I left the company for a little bit, and I'll, I'll get to that point, but they ended up de-rigging it and putting Bravo drives on it. And and sell, they sold it off. And that boat still is around, I believe, at Lake Mead, and it, and it still mm. runs good. But I think we had a total of, of four of the, the 30s out there at the time. Okay. okay. Uh, back when they built the first one, they also built a single-engine V-drive out of one. And that, that boat really? it, it wasn't very fast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a big V-drive, 30-foot, 31-foot V-drive, you know. Um, <laughs> You're out. They're out. Hey, Stan, slap a V-drive in this. You're like, oh, are you kidding yeah, me? <laughs> it, 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 it broke a lot. <laughs> So there's a lot of things that we did. We did a, a turbine 22. We had a turbine in a Oh, 22. no kidding. Huh. Yeah, back in, no, 82, 81, 82. Um, that was kind of a flop as well. Um, it, it didn't go very fast. It was 70 mile an hour boat. And and it had an afterburner on it. It, it, it threw a lot of flame. Yeah. You know, you could roast the marshmallows on the back, but... It, it it was fun, but it was just not just just didn't work. Seventy um, seventy mile an hour million dollar science experiment. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Ron was not scared to spend money. He when it came down to to designing and doing things, he wasn't scared to spend money. So hence hence the cat experiment. Hence the cat experiment that you know we 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 called it the fishing boat class when it raced because it was only seventy miles an hour. The tunnel was absolutely huge in the boat. The tunnel was a monster tunnel, and the running surfaces were very small. So it was trying to get a 35-foot boat up on water skis. Um, I think the boat ran 75 miles an hour. It, now, now it, you guys you guys built this as all your original plug? You guys did the whole deal? All the original plug, really? the wood plug, everything. And and it had, to, to race in class in APBA, it had to have de-stroked big blocks. They had to be 500-inch turbo, twin turbo motors, so they were gentry motors, um, Donovan blocks, but we ran a small block piston in them. So they had to be de-stroked down. They were like 355 inches, but a big block, out of a big block. And, boy, the motors made power. Um, Bob Teague built the first ones, and, and they made a lot of power, but, you know, it, the boat didn't work. So... Oh yeah, I don't care how hard you push the boat. Yeah, you know you, you could you could have you know drug it with a semi. It, it just was yeah. not fast. So there was two of them made. Um, one went to a guy named Bert Court, which you'll know. I know Bert well. Yeah, stuff. Bert had yeah. one. Um, Gary T. I didn't remember. I didn't remember he had a cat. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Gary T. Put that one together. Um, the boat was just as. It ran just as bad as our race boat, you know, as the so-called race boat. The race boat was actually uh, de-rigged down and made into a pontoon boat. 
So there they you cut the neck off of it and, <laughs> and did stuff. And, and every once in a while, you'll see it pop up on the internet. Like somebody uh, says, what is this? Like, you know, and you go, oh, uh, my God. You know, it's kind of a nightmare. When something like that pops up, a, a mistake like that pops up, you go, oh, God. You know, yeah. here it comes. Yeah. Here it comes yeah. again. Wow. So yeah. um, what ended up happening is, is, you know, now we're in the, in the mid-'80s. Fiberglass materials changing. We're going to vinyl esters. We're going to 6160 roving glass. You know, things are lightening up. Uh, vacuum bagging's coming into technique. So we're starting to vacuum bag boats, and, and we could take a 1,200-pound a pound bear hull and bring them down to about 950 pounds, wow. which was a lot. Wow. But the issue with the vacuum bagging, when we got into vacuum bagging, is that the boats were so stiff, it's like skipping a rock across the... Hmm. The, the water um the boat didn't want to flex and resettle so it was it was it was very jarring on your body when you ran them but super strong but jarring so we did um 21s and a couple 21s a couple 22s vacuum bagged and we had the we we brought the the motors out of the the cat and we put them in the 31 foot boat so the 31 we got to campaign all over the West Coast, because we were racing from here to Washington. Um, Puget Sound had a race in it. Um, we had San Francisco. We had Las, Las Vegas, Lake Mead had one. San Diego had a race. Uh, we had the shootout in Corpus Christi, East, east versus West shootout, um, which was a lot of fun because, you know, the East Coast guys always say they're, they're better and faster. You know, so we wanted to come out and see what can we do, you know, with them. Uh, and at that time... You know, we were racing the 30, uh, Bob Norskog um, was like the offshore guy. He was the god when it came to offshore racing. Yeah, especially and out here, right? Out here. And, and at that time, I was still I was still young. I was in my, my mid-20s, and, and um, most of the people that were offshore racing were, were a little bit older. We had Betty Cook racing um, in, in, in the Big Cougar that cougar cat which was fast you had bob norskog with uh bob teague and norm teague in the boat with them um you had uh gary um uh, jerry gilbreth was racing boats out there at that time you had all these these guys that were just a wealth of knowledge and experience and offshore stuff um and then here comes me not knowing a whole lot about offshore racing and saying hey let's go offshore racing uh, bob norskog was super neat guy i mean it was like oh he recognized who the next generation was which when it came to offshore racing you know it was guys my age kurt schoen was offshore racing at that time as well in a book called honcho um carson brummett same thing you know but but bob and i got along really really well i mean he would tell me the stories of, of where offshore racing came and started and i just wish that we could have recorded it because we lost a lot of history, a ton of history um, on how boats were set up and, and, and done. And that was when he was racing. He had an Apache that he raced. Um, he had the Can-Am, the boat, the Can-Am boat at that time in offshore racing. Mm -hmm. had the, the record from Canada to Marina del Rey. They also had the Sea of Cortez um, record where they ran from basically San Felipe to, to Cabo. Um, they had that record. This is when offshore racing, you know, I always say this is when the men were men. Um, yeah. We heard yeah. stories of, of, you know, Norm Teague, which is Bob's brother, older brother. Um, they were outside of Oregon running at night at 80 miles an hour with yeah. no moon and 12 foot seas. And Norm says, I thought I was going to die that night. Yeah, no yeah. GPS, trying to navigate no GPS, up the stars and compass. charts. Yeah, that's racing, you know. That oh my it, gosh. It came, it that's came insanity. Down is what racing. that is. Yeah, you know that that was racing. You know yeah. that's the racing yeah. that we grew up under. You know, in in with Shiata was we're endurance guys. You know, we want to make things run for a long period of time, not taking anything away from from any other boat class because every boat class is special. Um, 
it's just a, it's just a lot of fun, you know, being out there. And that's what boating's really changed too, you know, being in the industry as long as I have and watching, you know, what I have and being lucky enough to be able to create. Ron has always allowed me uh, to create. I want to try something. I just he, lay up a hole and try it. You know, do it. And yeah, and that's where we got where we are today by doing that. So through that time, we came up with the twenty one tunnel. Yeah, how did so, that come about? What I mean, what was the request? Okay. Why 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 did you guys do that? We were looking at outboards and in in, in, a, in a way to build boats. And there's a guy named Steve uh, Buckaloo, um, fireman out of Torrance. He he was racing lady crafts at that time in, in, in grand national racing, or, you know, in the, in the, not the grand national, but the distance racing, uh, Parker at that time was the Parker nine hour. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when, when you went out and raced, it wasn't a three hour race. It was a nine hour race. We'd go right. to Parker, everybody would pit and La Paz. And when the race started, it was nine hours long. Nutrition rate was tremendous. Um, hundred boats would start. 20 would finish. Everybody else would be broke. Broke or crashed. Uh, so Steve Bucklew came in and, and wanted to build a 20, but he wanted a tunnel boat. So he came up, he worked with Ron on coming up with a bottom design. Now, I think it was very, very close to the Levy design. And, it, you know, with Levy's tunnel. Because uh, that's what Steve was running at the time. So we basically took a boat, flipped a 20, flipped it upside down, and took a skill saw to it and started cutting it up. Literally, wow. To, to make a, a mod uh-huh. BP. And there was a guy named Tony Nunez at the time that ran our glass shop. Um, him and Steve worked side by side coming up with a bottom. So again, I stayed out of the glass shop. When, when I first started at the glass shop, uh, or first started at Chiata, they made me do everything. So I had to help lay up boats. I had to help tab boats, um, because the their belief was, well, you can't talk about it if you haven't done it. You know, you, you don't have the experience doing it. Don't do it. So at that time, like Lee would be in summer. You know, like see, Lee would be off for from school for summer, and he would come down to Shyad and work with us in the eighties. Now we're going. This back is Ron Sun Lee. Ron Sun. Gotcha. And Tony would, t- Tony, <laughs> Tony liked to joke around, and but Tony was very, Tony was very smart, and he knew the business, he knew the glass business, and he took Lee and I, and he made us do stuff, because his theory was, I never want you to make fun of our guys, meaning the glass shop guys. I never want you to make fun of these guys, if you don't know how hard they work. So we have a guy named Francisco in our glass shop. Absolutely, I'd give my shirt off my back to him. He's been with us for 30 years. He learned under Tony. Nobody works harder than them. Nobody works harder than glass shop guys. I, I yeah. don't care. You know, you go out there and and you put your head down into a mold that doesn't have a lot of air circulation, and you're working with resin and fiberglass all day long, holding a one gallon can to wet out material like they used to. And you're talking 10 gallons on the end of a stick with a brush. Mm -hmm. You got to be tough. You got to be a tough guy to do it. Um, you, you, no kid nowadays would do it, you know, which, which (laughs) we talked about earlier. Um, you know, so these guys love to work and, and Francisco, like if you look at my rigging now, which, is, is a lot of people say it's show stopping stuff, you know. Uh, I hate to say that because I'm not trying to make me sound good. It's the company oh, that stand. Is don't be modest because it is. It's the stuff. It, the, it, the boats it, are a work it, of art. Uh, without Francisco, my work wouldn't look that good because he gives me such a good base to work off of. It's like building a house. If you have a great foundation, the house comes out nice and square and straight and looks looks fantastic. Our guys in our glass shop, I always say, are the best. Um, but there's some great guys out there. But I, I look at it as, as without a good glass shop, you don't have a boat company. Look good. You look at a, a shy out of that's done and all gel coated with the inlays and the inside of the boat. The insides match the outside of the boat. 
um, we were about the first ones. I believe we were the first ones to start gel coating the inside of the boats and, and mm. color sanding the inside of the boats and polishing them and making them look like they look. Um, and then that that was setting an, indie, uh, an industry standard for guys like DCB and Eliminator and, and guys to say, hey, we got we got to do this and, and come up with it. And, and talking to guys like Dave um, when he owned DCB, and JT, the guy named JT that worked with Dave yep, when they sure. first started, they even say, hey, you know, we, we copied that stuff. You know, we, we wanted to make it look, you know, um, that good. And, and it's kind of nice because we built a lot of stuff in the industry that people copied. And we don't really, we kind of go, oh, at first you go, oh, look, they copied. But then you look back and go, you know, that's pretty cool. We did something right. Um, people don't know this, but back in the, the early 80s, we came out with the uh, angled bezel for the gauges. We were the first ones. Everything was flat. So we were doing a boat for Powerboat Magazine. They would have the performance trials, and we always rated ourselves how good we could do. And, and for eight years, I got overall quality of workmanship that Bob Norskog presented to, uh, for building the boats that were that were shown mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we came up with, the simple things, angled bezels, you know, to put the put in your boat. So mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. 80 boats where they started, we we're the first ones. Um, the next step, we we're the we we're the first ones um, when I met with Autometer uh, with a guy named Ken Beagle at the time, um, got us into Autometer gauges. Um, we we're the first one to use Autometer, but the two and five eighths gauges. Mm -hmm. And we went to the two and five eights, and then the industry followed along with that. Um, it, it's nice to set standards and have people do that because that's what made you know a lot of boating what it is today. Which you know there's still big gauges in boats besides all right. the electronic right. computer stuff right. that's coming out. Right. Well, I, I think you know, and I, you know, my dad had a boat shop forever and working on a lot of boats. I did. I I always. I, I, yeah, I think the thing you, what you guys did is maybe this sounds wrong, but I would tell guys all the time because people would say like, man, I just can't afford a Shiata, but God is so beautiful. And I'd be like, don't worry about it. Like Shiatas are literally overbuilt. Like they are built to take the most abuse that you can take. And, yeah. and they look like they look like that. And of course you got to charge for that. That's just, that's the price of quality. Right. But, um, you, your consistency was what it was. And we, Knowing a lot of people in the industry, there's a lot of companies that have what they call paycheck boats or payday boats. And it was yeah. like, you got to get that boat done, guys, if you want to get it, get paid. And that boat didn't sit in the mold as long. It didn't get finished like it should have. And there's a lot of that out there. And, and, and I'm not going to name names, but every one of the very quality companies, they've got those boats out there in, in the world. And But you guys, I don't think, because you were such a custom the way DCB is now, right? DCB sells 16 boats. So like they're going to take their time. It takes this long to build a boat and that's how long it takes. And we're going to live off that 16 boats. Right. And, and so yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. You, and, and the, also I think what really with the, with the big gauges as an example is by it's, it's kind of that thing, you know, race on race on Saturday and Sunday and sell on Monday. You guys, everything was geared to making that boat, the best race boat, the best ski race boat, the best marathon boat which are, like you said, they, they're built to live and they're built for function. They're, guys are trying to drive in traffic, watch a skier, so they need big gauges, they need angled gate bezels. Like That's the kind of stuff that functionally, if it can live in that environment, and you guys just, people picked it up. You know, they bought, they bought functional marathon race boats for ski race, you know, for ski cruisers. And, and again, right. even today, like, like with Andrew, man, people... They're, they're effective. They work great. And, and so I, I don't, that, that to me is your, has been your, your model. And it's the consistency, it, I think from what I've seen through the years is just that you can't, you can't beat it. You know, it's the, you know, Ron used to tell me, you know, when I build him a ski race boat, he goes, when I'm out there and the boat breaks, I'm not saying good things about you. <laughs> and, and it was like, Oh, Okay, so you kind of, I took it to heart, you know, I don't want things to break. And then Bob Teague, working with Bob, you know, through at Shiata, Bob would critique me heavy. I mean, it was like, you know, he would yell at me. Yeah, I mean, you know, straight on yell at me and, 
and um, he would do it right in front of Ron. I mean, he did not care, and, and it was the school of hard knocks, which I had thick skin. I don't think people nowadays would not put up with a lot of things, you know, in the older days that these older guys sure, would do. Yeah, yeah. us. And Bob had a saying, and I still follow the saying, is your most precious commodity is your time off with your family. Because we all work hard. When you go out, you want to spend time with your your family. You don't want to be broke down on the side of a lake. You don't want to be standing on the shore. I've seen too many things where people are the wife and the kids. They're in life jackets. They have the tubes. And the guy's bent over working on his boat. And yeah. Bob always told me, don't ever have that happen to you. Don't put your customers through that. Do what you have to do. I don't care if it's getting up in the middle of the night and driving to Havasu and working on their stuff, you're going to do it. We, we will do everything we can for our customers to, to keep them on the water. And mm -hmm. that's the big thing. Um, so as we go, um, the 20 came up. We, we had the 20 tunnel boat. The 20 tunnel boat actually runs really good. Uh, my wife has one. It's pink, um, pink and blue, it's still pink and blue. Um, <laughs> No, no, is that it's is that what you guys do? You guys call it the River Cruisers, the tunnel? That's that's no, just we call it the the SS Tunnel. It's a SS tunnel. tunnel. Okay. Yeah, the cruiser, the River Cruiser is the twenty one. The Day Cruiser is the twenty two. Okay. Okay. And then the week, you know, they they called it the Offshore was the twenty four at the time, but the twenties are always been SS uh, boats, like Super Sport stuff, mm -hmm. and um, absolutely the most phenomenal boat to ski behind. There's there's really no way. Oh really. Yeah, you could just go out and have a, a blast huh. with uh, with the with the with the twenty, um, and then we came up to do the twenty one because our twenty at that time brought the Bravo drives were coming into to the market. Mercury was doing the Bravos. Mm -hmm. uh, Pallet was killing the Bravos, building them because they started their two ten project which had mm -hmm. a higher transom. They were selling, mm -hmm. God, everything out of them. Um, so we needed something to compete because at that time, Hallett was our, our biggest competitor um, in those days. So we decided we would build a, a tunnel, a 21 tunnel. We basically used the same bottom, but we ended up adding a lot more weight to the boat, a lot more freeboard and height so we could get a Bravo drive, you know, with a motor, trying to get a stock motor under the hatch. And that was the, the Bulldog motor at the time Mercury had, um, mm -hmm. which was a carbureted motor, was, was the main seller on those. Um, and then we started building them with uh, 509 Teak motors with a little B&M blower on them. And we sold quite a few of them. Um, the boat got a bad rap after a while. Some people said, oh, you know, we, we had a couple, we actually had a couple crash. And, oh, really? Yeah. And it, and it wasn't from what we did to them. They, the hard part about any boat company is that if you hear of a boat that crashes, everybody says, oh, did you see that Hallett? Did you see the Eliminator? Yeah. Oh, did you, yeah. did you hear about that Shyana? And we're like, we're getting hit for something we didn't do. Um, one was a mechanical error. The guy had the boat worked on. And it, it dropped a tab while he was running it. And we had tunnel tabs that would pack air in the tunnels. And he, and he went into a turn and dropped the tab and blew the boat over, uh, blew it over sideways. So the other one was a, another, I won't get into the other one, but it was another, you know, owner-driver mistake. And it was a really easy mistake. It's freaking hats killing me. You're not used to it. <laughs> Figure it's an Eddie hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd be. I, I thought I'd be nice. I'll you know do a little memorial. You know I don't have many hats. I'm like okay, I'll make Ed proud. We'll, we'll have to get you a shy out of hat. <laughs> okay, send him, I'll, I'll wear it. Send me one. So, so back to the tunnels. The other one was a it was a mechanical error on the driver's side. What he did, he rolled the boat over. So and then all of a sudden you have all these websites. From Hot Boat website to River Dave's website, we're, we're what we call the authorities. Uh, yeah, we have the internet professionals. 
and they all get in and they start chiming in on what happened. Um, and, and it's, we, we, we laugh at them as, as industries. Cause like Mike Willen from Howard boats and, and Dave, when he had DCB and, and all, all of his companies, you know, even when, when, uh, Jim Cole was around, we all got along. We all get along. It's amazing. People think none of us get along, but we all do. I mean, we have we performance evaluations. We all hang out on the beach yep. together. We all go out and have dinner together, and and even after boat shows, we would we would go over to the claim job after the LA boat show when it was come, when the LA boat show was going. Gene and I um, would meet up at Claim Jumper and have dinner at nine o'clock at night when we got home, um, because of the fact that. You know, we knew each other, and we knew what customers would say about, you know, each of us, which was always good because then we'd come over, hey, did you hear about this guy saying this? Yeah, and we would right. hear customers. Right. Customers would come over and say, hey, did you hear what Gene said about you? And then I'd at yeah, dinner, I'd say, Gene, you say this? He says, no, this yeah. is what this guy said, you know, because they're always yeah. trying to get a rise out of it. But back to, to when things happen, um, they'll be – what we're facing now is we're getting people that are building Shiatas that are 1977s, 1978s. And that boat is old. And fiberglass doesn't last forever. And you could take and re-gel coat the outside of the boat, and you could clean up the inside and try to change the stringers out and things. But the main factor of that boat is still old fiberglass, wore out fiberglass. That's very flexible. We call them wet potato chips. And, and guys put a ton of money into them. They put 100000 into these things and restore them. Well, when that boat goes out and comes apart, just because of that boat was built for 460 horsepower, right. nowadays, uh, Carson Brummett, Bob Teague, um, I got one of Carson's motors in there that well over 1,500 horsepower. Uh, we got motors in there from, from Teague, well over 1,350 lower motors um, because of the horsepower is what the customer wanted from the motor builder, you know, from Bob or, or, or Carson. We, we basically deal with two motor builders, Bob. and You want a blower motor? We're going to send you over to, to Bob T. If you want a turbo motor, we're going to send you over to Carson Brummett. And we have motors on, on order all the time from them. But when you take 1500 horsepower at, 1,500 pounds of torque, you're going to tear up that early, you know, that early boat. Boat. Yeah. yeah. So when uh, we have a boat about. have an issue, when we have a boat that has an issue and it breaks apart, you, you could break them. Um, when you talked about the 788 boat, um, our ski whole ski race boat, we joke around because we keep a boat at Lake Mead year round. And that was during an offshore race. We actually, um, lost a boat there with a brand new turbo motor in it. it it's in the bottom of Lake Mead. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, down by Battleship. We actually, Ron got into good water and opened it up, and next thing you know, there's water coming in the boat. I mean, it blew into the boat. The boat went down in 58 seconds. And what they remember when, when Jeff was in the boat at the time and Ron was in the boat, they looked down, and there was a railroad tie inside the boat. Oh, jeez. There's a big 10 by... 10 piece of lumber that came through the bottom of the boat and it stuck into the V drive. And, and they were, they, both of them said, yeah, they, it was sitting in there and, uh, the boat went down pretty quick. And, uh, I'll give you a little bit more interesting fact on that. Um, so we'll go, we'll go back to that losing that boat. Cause we did something at Lake Mead. We're the only ones that have, have done it in history basically. So, when you hear of a boat going, coming apart or crashing or doing something, hitting a dock, we've had a couple of them hit docks, and you have all these people come out and start saying, "Oh, this happened, that happened." They don't know. It, it's kind of we, that's why we call them the internet professionals. You know, it, it just builds into this great big thing. You know, the telephone game. You tell one guy, he tells another, he tells another. Um, that's disheartening for a manufacturer to, to see that and hear that because it's scarring the manufacturer. 
it, it's crazy. I, and I, I used to go on the forums in the old days when I was doing tech and selling parts because you want to, you want to see what's going on, but you know, kind of, I go on like, there's a lot of Facebook groups now. Right. And yeah. it, it, there's really a, like shoemaker chimes on. There's a lot of good guys that chime on. You can really get some information, but for every like one good valid answer, you'll have 10 guys like you, dude, you pull that out of your ass. Like, <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's really disheartening because I, I go on there all, all the time and, and learn stuff, but man, you got to whittle through and, and, and the guys that moderate these sites too, they'll be like, come on guys, if you don't know, just shut up. You know, I'm a sucker for some of that. Lee, Lee tells me, I go, Lee, did you hear this? Lee goes, get off the internet, yeah. quit reading yeah. the internet. You know, and you can gain a huge amount of knowledge from the websites. Um, we, we look at some of this stuff and we said, we're not going to answer that. We're not going to stick yeah. our, our necks out. Um, yeah. I know Shoemaker. I've known Shoemaker. I, I built one jump boat my whole life. Um, Did Greg set the pump. Yeah. Uh, so I got to, I know, you know, know Greg from yeah. there. And, yeah. and and there's, you know, Tony Scarlatta. There's, you know, the guys that know stuff, Dave Rankin, that know a lot of stuff. But going back to the 21, when we get back to the story where people go, what happened to the 21 at Mead? So we were racing at Mead. We opened it up in good water. And Ron and a guy named Jeff was in the boat, and they hit something, blew the bottom out of the boat. Boat went down. We came back. We were there. And it's it's kind of heartbreaking coming back with an empty trailer. Um, because every time you look back there, you think, geez, you know, boats, yeah. you know, all, all this hard work. You know, we built this thing. It's gone, you know, in a matter of seconds. So we turned around and we found a guy actually in King Harbor that had a bath, a bath, a little submarine, two man submarine. Oh, no way. Yeah. We, we, uh, it, what it was used for, um, like, I guess Avalon up in, in Catalina has a very short runway. And if a plane crashed, they would take this thing out to go find the plane in which, is never a good story because if a plane went down out there, there's usually a body yeah. or whatever. So we hired the guy and the guy said, okay, I'll get a trailer. He had a trailer for it and they lifted it up and they had to add more flotation to it because it was going from salt water, which is more buoyant, mm. to fresh water. So they had to put more like ping pong balls in it or whatever they did to make the thing float. We towed it up to Lake Mead where the boat was. We had to get special permission from the Vegas gambling committee commission um so they had to have a guy out there um from the casinos this this guy watching what we were doing um they had to have we had to specify what we were doing and we were the first ones uh to take a submarine onto lake mead and and uh it was kind of neat you know they had a lot of people came out you know press things came mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and um you know the sheriffs were there because what we found out was Back in the early days, and I'm going to say early days, like when the mobs ran the casinos, when they changed a casino, what they told us, they would take all the old gambling chips and dump them in Lake Mead. So they wanted to make sure we weren't harvesting old chips. Chips, no way. Now, I don't know if they were silver or, you know, all the gambling yeah. chips I always see are yeah. like this carbon, you know, cardboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they wanted to make sure we we weren't harvesting chips out of the bottom of Lake oh Mead because they go to the deepest part. The deepest part is by the dam. We went down at Battleship Rock right outside the the dam. So we actually had a bath scap up there for two days. The guys went down, the guys that owned it, went down to about 450 feet of water. They had no visibility, and they kept getting mm. stuck in trees. So we never found the boat. So the boat's down there somewhere. You know, oh brand new gosh. turbo motor. It's not worth anything anymore. It's probably just splinters and you know, and just de you know decayed material. But right, yeah, we right. keep a boat up wow. there. But we're the first ones. Great effort. Submarine. Great effort. Yeah, we're the first ones ever take a submarine up to 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 Lake Mead. And the only reason I think Ron did it is because it had a brand new turbo motor in it. From about mid eighties, eighty six to ninety two, I ran the company, and I was trying to sell boats. I was trying to build boats and order all the parts and run everything. It, it was just way overwhelming. So at that time, Lee, um, Ron's son, was getting out of college. You know, he was an econ major getting out of the University of Texas. So, 
you know, I, I was talking to him because we grew up together. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. I said, good. Why don't you come here and run the company? So I could go in the shop and do what I do, you know, most of all, what I do. And he said, sure. So he came in, and we worked together until about 95, 96. And I was getting bored of doing what I was doing. I mean, I love doing what I do, but I was, at that time, I was like, there has to be more to it. There has to be more to boat, the boat business. So I was going to branch out on my own. And I built a garage at my house in Torrance, and I was going to rig boats and do things. But at that time, Bob Teague, you know, because Bob Teague and I have always been really, really close. Um, he calls me and says, hey, I, I need help. Uh, at that time, Bob Norskog, I believe, had already passed away. Um, and they had the comp center going. with His brother, Norm, and him started the comp center, or took over the comp center mm -hmm. under... Mm -hmm. T Customerine, which was Bob's mm -hmm. company. Norm was coming to work for Bob. So Bob had a guy named Todd Melky that worked for him. And Todd and I were good friends. And, and Bob says, hey, I got some jobs I need help with. Can you come up here and help me? So I said, sure. So I went to Van Nuys and started working in Van Nuys with Bob. And then he had a couple bare holes, shy out of bare holes. And he says, hey, you know, I know you're doing this on your own. Would you rather just come and work for me and, and build these boats? Um, one thing led to another, and, and I ended up working for Bob full time. Uh, in the midst of that, the first year is when the North Northridge earthquake hit, and mm -hmm. he had a building up in Valencia. So that took us from the comp center being heavily hit by the earthquake uh, to where T Customerine is now. So Todd was running the back of the shop for the first couple of years, and then Todd ended up leaving Bob and going to work for the studios. Um, and I took over the back shop at Bob's. So in the next chapter, my boat building came to, at that time, was offshore boats, everything offshore boats. Now, I raced a 30-foot, you know, 31-foot boat, mm -hmm. you know, all over the place. We knew the offshore world. Um but now it was stepping up where, where fountain boats were, the, were the, the premier boats at that time. Everybody wanted a fountain. You know, not everybody, but most people yeah. wanted a fountain. And, and that's, where, that's where Bob's or Bob Teague's business just went, right? It, just everything exactly. Was big. And Larry Smith from Scarab was there. You know, we, we mm. ran into him a lot. Um, we were building Scarabs. We were building fountains. We were building every offshore boat in the world, plus uh, uh, had was Ricky Ford? Yes, Ricky Ford. I'm sorry. Um, so we were doing the skaters with Archer Marine and what it did was you could think you're the best boat builder in the world or the hottest rigger in the world, but until you get into another out of your comfort zone and get to see how everybody else builds stuff, I realized that I didn't know what I think I should know in the industry. So it was always a learning prospect. We we're there, we we're learning the the issue that I had working there through APBA, you know, him racing APBA and Popra, we were never home. We were working six days a week. I mean, it was like NASCAR. We're working six days a week, 14 to 16 hours a day, and we were traveling from here to the East Coast, from the East Coast back here, from here to race, from just back and forth. Now, we had at that time, when I was running the back of the shop over at Teague's, we had 18 race teams. And 18 national race teams, meaning we were running boats on the East Coast and the West Coast. And I had to have, my crew was, I would have two guys for every boat. So we had, at that time, you know, we had 30 some odd guys, you know, working and running and doing things. And, and behind the scenes was a complete madhouse. I, I, so um, you're servicing 18 teams that were on yeah. the tour. That's crazy. And, and this went for years. And it almost cost me my marriage. My wife finally said, forget it. I'm not doing all this. You know? So, so you know, you, you, she would bring the kids to the shop. You'd see them at the shop. I mean, one of the stories, we had a boat called Gone Again, um, Rick Bowling's boat. He was in the points race, so in modified class. So we had these big mo uh, modified Pontiac motors that we had run in the boat. And we were down in Dana Point on a Friday. Friday afternoon, he launches a motor. And he's in it for points. So a guy named Mike Kitagawa that worked for Bob and I, we, we went to Bob and we said, well, we'll take the boat back to Valencia and 
we'll pull the motors out, we'll prep the motors that they had in the rigging shop or in the engine room, which were long blocks. We'll prep those motors and we'll put them back in the boat and we'll, we'll try to get the boat back here in the morning time. So Mike and I, um, Rick towed the boat down there. Mike and I got the motor out. Mike started working on the on the long blocks, basically accessorizing the motors. I had the whole oil cooler system out of the boat because we had to flush everything. I mean, there were dry sumps. We had to get everything out of the boat, mm. put everything back. Um, and at 7 a.m., we pulled back into Dana Point with that boat running. And he ended up winning, you know, his national points uh, by us getting that boat together. That's what we would do. I mean, that's the the thing we would do for people. Uh, Be up all night, work all night, and then basically sleep for an hour and come out and enjoy the race. When I went to Bob's, huge learning experience. You know, these are offshore boats. What makes offshore boats work? What makes things stay together? What, What fails? It allowed me to go into any boat shop in Southern California when we were delivering a motor or doing stuff and seeing how their operations worked. So it was kind of neat. You know, we could walk into mm-hmm. Eliminator, walk in the back, see what was going on. We could walk into Cole. We could walk into Howard. We could, you know, we could we could go to all these places and see how everything was built. Now, that was a learning experience. So it was like going to college. You can come out of high school and go to college. So towards the end, I was there for five years. Um, Bob and I, I kind of looked, Bob was a father figure to me at that time. And it got to a point where he would say white and I would say black. <laughs> and I'm going, well, this isn't work. You were there. You were around at that time. So you, you, you would see us, you know, we would start arguing. And yeah. you were, you were getting, but you were getting to the other side of the father figure I, thing where <laughs> I, I, um, you know, my ego was getting big and his ego was there, you know? So it, it you know, it, it, we, we started fighting all the time. And I, I said, you know, before it blows up the, the whole relationship and everything that I've done and worked for, it's best for me to leave. So I actually went to um, went to Howard next door. Bob was at oh, a race yeah. one day, and I packed up my toolbox and pushed it next really? door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> Howard was right next door to him for years, right? Gene was always at the at the fence, and any one of the the Teague employees would come out. Gene would be going. Hey, when you when you get tired of him, come over here. When you get tired of him, just come over here. <laughs> he was poaching, and and there's a lot of guys that went from Teagues to Howard. So, you how know, many I, how many came back though after they got they had the they got used to Gene? Ex- exactly, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> Gene like was Gene. not easy. Gene was I not like easy. Gene, but that was at the time where Mike and Gene didn't get along. Oh my gosh. And it was very, very tough working because you never knew what you were going to walk in. You know, every day there was an argument between the two. And Oh, my yeah, gosh, yes. The mistake I made going there is that Gene only built stock boats. I've never built a stock boat. It was like, I never built a Mercruiser with a 330 in it. You know, I did. You know, I, we put outdrives and stuff, but it always, everything was high performance. So... Yeah. It was like I was out of my sink. And, and yeah. after almost a year, you know, Mike and Gene started getting along and, and, the, and the economy was kind of dumping. And it was like, yeah, it's best for me, you know, to leave on good terms. Um, which without them saying, hey, you know what, if this isn't working, I wouldn't be at where I was at, I'm at today. So hmm. I turned around and, and, you know, gathered up my work ethics from, from T in and uh, now Ron and I from Shida, we never, we, we, we never lost uh, being in touch with each other. We were always, we'd call on the phone. We would talk to each other. Lee was running the place. Uh, a guy named Charlie Ward was doing the rigging with, with um, Lee. Charlie wanted to change life. He wanted to go back into his business, which was construction, tilt, big tilted built buildings. Um, not little things, but big things. Um, so Ron, they're, they're always like, when are you coming back? Just give me a call. So I called and I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to come home. They said, come on home. And instantly we moved in and Lee says, I'm taking care of this part of the shop and this part of the shop. You take care of this part of the shop. Let's do this. Let's get it moving again. So awesome. we started building the most, you know, we would do, Lee would do a purchase order on a boat 
and the customer would come in and I usually meet with the customer on a bill say well how, how do you want this what do you want you know what do you what do you want to see and I had customers come in and say build it like it was yours you know carte blanche I'll pay you just build and it took the company in the customer world way out I mean we started doing stuff um, not with the frou-frou drink cup holders that light up and, and outside right, water light. Right, I mean, right. we started getting into our hydraulic steering systems that were working. We were moving struts again. We were playing with cab plates and what to do uh, with cab plates and making them different. Uh, we went from a 3 16th cab plate that went off the back of the boat a foot to quarter inch cab plates that are at the at the keel over 20 inches long off the back of the boat mm. sending the, the cab bar six inches back off the back of the boat and and not because you know we move things like that because we were working with geometry and things that were that we were breaking so we go oh this isn't working there's too much of a bind here there's too much of a bind there we're, mm-hmm. we were mm-hmm. we actually broke arp 716 bolts off our cab assembly oh. and which, if you know an ARP bolt, you know people go, "You can't break them." We shoot yeah, the heads break, off. Right. Um, we're breaking half-inch turnbuckles, five-eighths turnbuckles. Now we're to three-quarter-inch turnbuckles with the. Oh, are you really? Plates. Wow. Yeah, um, keeping things alive and, and running the boats. We started getting motors from Bob and Carson. Now the motor industry, after 2008, the motor, the horsepower started going way up. Um, Carson, uh, at the time now, is building the world's fastest piston-driven um, skaters. You know, what, what did he do at, at the last Desert Storm, 204 yeah, miles? Yeah, 204, yeah, because he does he does Gary Smith um, stuff, yeah. yeah. American Ethanol, um, when you go back to the Ozarks, needs four motors to go faster than that. Carson's yeah. doing it with two. Um, I know, I, I don't want to tell you, really, I can't. Because that's for Carson to say what his motors actually put out horsepower wise. I'm doing one right now. I know it's going to be over 2,000 horsepower. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I know Gary. I, I I talked. I interviewed Gary for a story uh, after uh, Lotto, and I'm, I'm yeah, he was like at 2,000, 2,200, something like that, an engine. Yeah. And yeah. and the thing is, is a Shiata, you're not going to use that. You're you know, amazing people go, yeah, I'm building these motors, you know, Alexi and Bob, you know, I can't forget Alexi. Um, and even the guys at Paul Foth, you know, they're building motors that are 1500 horsepower. You know, it's easy for them now to build a 1500 yeah. horsepower motor. We use 1200 at the most and 1200. Now our, our 21 with a Carson EFI turbo motor in it, um, people go, how fast have you been? And I'm like, okay, our Shiata um, runs, oh, the fastest I've had it is 122 miles an hour. That's in ideal conditions. Lee's had his to up to 128, I think. Um, but now it's to the point where I go, I don't need to go that fast. I, I don't need to go that fast anymore. When you go that fast, it hurts. People go, what does it feel like? Um have your face sandblasted because that's what it feels like. Your, your, your cheeks are up by your ears. You can't breathe. Your ears are ringing because of the wind going by so quick. Um, people go, why don't you wear a helmet? Because if you, you know what? It doesn't matter if you hit the water at that fast, you're going to die. It's going to bucket. Yeah. 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 Um, I do wear a life jacket just so, you know, I tell people and all the 21s and 22s, everything, 24s that I built, always wear a life jacket. Um, at least we'll have a body for the funeral is what we call it if something <laughs> catastrophic goes wrong. So, and if people go, oh, no, it could never, I'm always thinking about something going wrong. Oh, God, and, yeah, especially, I mean, 100, you know, God, I know stories of guys at 75 miles an hour. that you just, and, and, you can't, yeah. and it hurts. I don't want any yeah. of our customers to have to go through that. So yeah. what's done it to me is making a boat, taking all, you can't say take the risk out of it, but margin of error. So people see what I do, um, and, and like I said, they'll copy it, you know, through pictures on the internet or, or whatever, not totally understanding. I always tell people, make sure the prop shaft's dimple. They're like, what do you mean? When you put it up in the split coupler and you have that set screw, you got to make sure you dimple 
and set that set screw inside that prop shaft. You got to do it to the output shaft of the V drive as well. You know, you got to run two safety collars. Um, safety collars on the rudder so the rudders don't get sucked out of the boat. Um, biggest thing is is I lap all my props onto my prop shafts. So I take lapping mm -hmm. compound, get a prop, and I start lapping. Mm -hmm. if, if you ever do that and look at them, you'll, you'll see that when they machine a prop, um, it's not perfectly round inside, you know, so there's margin of errors. And if you don't fit the prop right, you're going to break the prop shaft. And a lot of people, all these GN guys that, that uh, had shot at us and stuff that would run those three-hour races now say, oh, I broke the prop shaft. Yeah, because you didn't fit the prop on it right. You know, there's ways to do it. Um, you got to try to build, I try to build the most safest boat possible for what it does. Now, there's no guarantee, but I try to do the safest thing possible. Um, I don't want it ever coming back and saying it was it was error. Um, so yeah, back to know, that. And just and that and the nature of a V drive. I mean, V drives obviously have a ton of inherent uh, positive qualities. I mean, you know, they handle the horsepower, the rough water. There's just a lot of cool stuff about a V drive. Yeah. The down downside of a V drive is a lot of bits and pieces, and like you just said, you got to have the safety yeah. colors everywhere. Like, and it's it's I think it's easy for people to forget or not not dot their I's and cross their T's because there's just so much involved and so much to vibrate and so much to break. And we, we yeah. call it at our shop, we call it the touch factor. So when we built a, if I'm to build you a 21 or 22, 24 B drive, every part in that boat will be touched three times. Meaning that if I put the motor rails in, I will put the motor rails in. I fit the motor rails. I'm always going to trim on them. I'm going to take them back out of the boat, trim on them put them back in the boat and check them. Okay. So I'll build the whole boat out of raw material. All be, the whole boat will be raw except the plumbing and the wiring. I do not put that on. So I do all the rigging of the boat, trans mounts, motor mounts, everything. Um, will come out of the boat at least two or three times when I'm building it to, to machine, to fit, because not all of them are, it's not the same boat. Um, Every one, the stringers are in it a little bit different. Um, one stringer might be a little bit higher than the other, which is normal. If you measure our stringers, one's always higher than the other. Um, you know, one's going to be a little bit thicker on one side than the other. So we're always fitting. When you're thinking those skaters are running hard or a shy out of you see running down the river hard, we're burning 1.75 gallons a minute. Almost two gallons a minute we're burning through. And normally that's ab gas or race gas. So, again, now you're, you're back to what does it feel like running one of those boats. Besides hurting your face, hurting your ears, um, you come back to drive down the freeway and throw a $10 bill out the window every minute. Okay? So, that's what it feels like. When people go, what does it feel like? That's what it feels like. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. It, it, is, it is fun, though. I can't, I can't look at it that way because... We've taken people out for rides, and, you know, we, we have a thing. Lee and I have a thing. Never scare your, your rider. Never scare your the people that are with you. Um, so if you start seeing them do just the lightest thing that they don't look comfortable, don't take them any faster. I've had people I've taken out in 21 shiatas, and I'm at 80 miles an hour. And these are guys that, oh, I got a 100-mile-an-hour jet boat. At 80 miles an hour, they're thumbing me down, you know. Because they don't feel comfortable, and the boat is just mm -hmm. sitting there. Mm -hmm. And they come back, and how fast were you? We had to be going 110 miles an hour. And I'm thinking, 80 miles an hour. You know, no way. My boat's a, no, because your boat's not a 100-mile-an-hour boat. So the thing is with the Shiata, the fun fact is, when we get a lot of the source power, and we could run 65 to 110 in 3.5 seconds, that is a blur. So that's the adrenaline rush. For these guys, um, so in the the time now that Lee and I are building boats and we're building them for customers that are just saying, "Hey, unlimited pocketbook, here you go, um, build me the the nicest thing out there." Every single one's a little bit different because we keep trying to have to upgrade what sure. we're doing, sure. and it takes a lot of thought and, and things. So every part gets touched three times. 
Then it goes to the polisher, goes to the anodizer, and then we put the boat in. Now, if you look after I build the boat and I start putting it together, I hand polish every nut and bolt that goes in the boat by hand. So I go take it to a deburrer wheel, knock off all the machine marks on it, and then I polish them now all by hand. And we have about 80 hours in, in fastener polishing on a V-Drive. So when you start looking, how come a V-Drive costs so much? Well, when you look at, say, if, if your shop time's $100 an hour and, and you're, you're spending, you know, labor like that, it's not uncommon to have 2,000 hours in a V-Drive. Yeah. People go, yeah, absolutely oh, not. absolutely not. You know, we hand paint our fuel tanks um, to match the, the outside of the boat. We, we do the gel coat work to match the outside of the boat. All the polishing, all the anodizing, all the polishing of nuts and bolts. Um, we came up with our own hydraulic steering system for our V-Drive. So we custom make our steering rams and have, you know, that we're the only ones that, that get that. We build our own oil cooler mounts. We build everything in the boat we built. You know, ski toe, you want a ski toe? Well, it comes out of a piece of raw material right. that I get from right. industrial metals. Um, everything comes out of raw material. So... As we came up and did things to the V-drives, we had to start running bigger and bigger gears in it. So 42s were, were normal, and then we started getting to 48s. Well, the Casale V-drive box wouldn't take very much over a bigger gear unless you cut the water jacket out. Well, for mm -hmm. us, we don't want to cut the water jacket out because it's right by our legs, and it's a family boat, and it gets hot. Right. So we wanted to keep the water jacket. Now, the thing is, if anybody ever experiences in a V-drive, V-drives will puke a lot of oil out of them. I don't care if you have a catch can in them or not. They'll start puking oil. Because when you get to a, a cruiser that's running a big gear, so say we're running 48s, the top gear is really big, and the bottom gear is really small. So go back to a set of 12s or 9s. The gears are almost the same size. So you have a, a bottom gear is almost the same size as a top gear. So when you take that bottom gear and you start compressing it smaller for the bigger gear on top, as a V-Drive makes it, it takes more oil. There's more room for oil in the bottom mm. part of the case. Okay. So people fill the, the bottom of the case until it comes out the bottom oil fill of a Casale box, mm -hmm. or even our, our new boxes, our billet boxes. So when you run it, it would take that oil and packs it up. The gear's this big, it would pack it between the water jacket and the top gear, which was very little room, and it pressurizes the case. Because you're packing oil against a gear, it's 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 making mm -hmm. it's pressurizing it. So it starts building pressure and it starts puking it out. Um so we, we turned around and we said, Well, now we have Carson and Tiger building bigger and bigger motors. The guys in 21s want to go faster and faster. Um, we gotta start putting bigger gears in it, which is gonna be another story I'm gonna get to. So we designed a box that was bigger on top than a regular Casale case. Casale case comes straight up. Ours comes out. Okay, so no, it looks still, like a, still, based, still based on a split case? Still based on a split case. Okay. Um, when Andy was around. So we, we our machinist and, and I came up with this, this case. Um, he was building, my machinist was building cases for Broxma before Broxma Path was, was killed in his drag, or, or died of a heart attack, not drag boat. He was a drag boat guy, died of a heart attack. Right. Um, he was building a billet case. So we kind of took over the funding for that billet case because people, some people wanted billet cases. Um, our interest is we wanted to design our own box that we could put a bigger gear in. So what we came up to is I'm going, I want a case that will fit up to a 72 gear in it. I want to put a volleyball in that thing. I want mm -hmm. it big. My thing is a lot of people go, oh, when you start running out of gear, you start putting in bigger propellers, no. which bigger propellers start making the boats, the V-Drive cruisers. They start That's making the boat story. move around in the back. You start moving that boat around in the back, and now you're on the edge. So what my thing is, I like a taller gear and a smaller propeller. Because now the propeller can't manhandle the boat. Mm, makes sense. Okay. So, but you're keeping the RPM range in. So, I went into, I wanted to run 60s in some of the, the boats that we have. Mm -hmm. So, to do that, I wanted it water jacketed. 
So we went down and we said, we're taking a Casale box with 60s in it and we're going to build a new case. We're going to backwards engineer it, okay, which we did and came up with our, what we call our Super B drive, which goes on all okay. of our B drives now. Um, Does it? Okay. So people look at it and they don't really, there's not a big difference and they don't notice it. Totally different box, you know, Casale shaft. You know, I went to, to Andy and Drew, and we sat down, and I said, I've known them for a long time. You know, I've known them for almost uh, for over 40 years. I'm not in here to put you, to, to try to put you out of business with a new V-Drive. I need you to stay in business with us so I could get my parts. I didn't want to start building gears. I didn't want to start building shafts. I didn't want to start building spacers. I didn't want to do any of that, because if I had to build gears... To, to, to get, get a, somebody that knows a gear hopper and can make a gear, you know, you're just not going to build one. You're going to build 10 gears. And you're going to put a, a, a fortune into these gears that you're never, mm -hmm. ever, ever going to get out. So we designed the bigger box for that using all of Andy's internal parts. So we're in it for our own gaskets and our own case. That, Is that that's your standard V drive now? Everything gets that? Yeah. Now, the smallest gear it will take is a 38. It won't oh, so you just. can't go. Okay. I Well, there's two things. I ran a double water jacket. I have an overhead water jacket and a, and a water jacket down below. And if you want to run both water jackets, you can't put a, a gear in it smaller than a 38 because the bottom gear hits the hits mm. the case. So if gotcha. you want to get away from that you want and you want to run a smaller gear – you actually have to cut the lower water jacket out of it, which you can. You just machine it out like you do the top. You can, oh, you so you can do that, functions like that? Yeah. Yeah. So doing all the testing and running old things, I, I take heat guns out, and when we're testing, we're, we're checking everything. Um, I, I, I check the box all the time, and I want that box about 130 degrees, 135 degrees, which, which is really good normally on a normal run. When you... Mm -hmm. Really lay into it hard, you'll see the oil temperatures come up a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, we don't want it to be puking oil out. With with having more area between the upper water jacket and the gear keeps the pressure down. And also, we're we're keeping that box cooler by having more area, more room in that box. So that works out. Have you well. have you found? I mean, the bearings and everything. Do they live better? Have you? Um, yeah, we're not burning the oil like we do the small boxes. Usually at the end of the year, you take the oil out and it smells up the whole shop because it's, it's yeah, burned gotcha. oil. Do you sell these if a, if a guy wants to come off the street yeah. and buy the cases? Yeah, you sell just the cases? One. You sell a whole yeah, B-drive? We'll yeah, we'll sell them the case. And we've done that to quite a few people. Um, but a lot of times, if you know if they don't, you don't really need it. You know, you could go to a standard box. A lot of the flat bottom guys go to the standard boxes. So they're not running the gears that we're running. Um, but... It, it comes down now where when we build a boat, again, people come up and say, just build it like you want to build it. So we're starting to look into the billet transmission cases, single bell housings. Mm -hmm. We're looking at different things to, to take us to keep going into a different level. Sure. So sure. we're talking about things we're touching. We're always touching parts before they go into the boat. Are you still putting 400s in most everything? Yeah. Yeah, the Turbo 400 and V-Drive is, is really a cool factor because it it really is. Around, it's just for around docks. It's just so the motor's not loading up and you're not, you mm -hmm. know, stalling. First gear's for around docks. Um, coming into a dock, it, you, you can pop it in and out with no problem. Second gear um, is is for pulling the boats up on plane. You know, you bring it up to about 3,500 and you just push it over into third gear. Um, and, and the RPM will settle down and, and you're running. The thing now with the power that these guys are making on motors, we're not using second gear very much anymore. You know. Oh, we're, really? We're, we're coming out and just putting it in just third. Pull gear them out in third, huh? huh? And and it's just it's just winding the thing up and, and putting it up, which comes back to making sure the boat is right and doing different things. Um, you know, V drives always have a harmonic. They have a harmonic that you can't even feel. Um, it, it, basically, from the rudder. The rudder, when we take a rudder and we put it in a boat, like in any boat, so people know about V-drives, that blade on the very bottom is only about three-eighths of an inch to a quarter inch wide on the bottom. Zero in the front to the back. And then, and then it tapers down to the bottom. 
it vibrates. You can't feel it, but I've been in boats where it sheared bolts in half hmm. because of, of the harmonics. It will shear mm -hmm. cap plate bolts off. It will do things. So you have to do everything you can to, to try to take all the vibration out of a boat. So one of the things that we do, um, I don't like three blade propellers. I tell people no three blade propellers on, on a 21 Shiata. And the reason being, you're going to pitch the blade off a three blade with the power that they make now. Um, so if you have anything under 800 horsepower, you could run a three blade. Anything above 800, we tell you no on that. What's the propeller of choice these days? Oh, two blade billet. Um, my favorite propeller is an 11 and a half 15 on a Shiata. So when people mm -hmm. call and they say, what propeller do you like? 11 and a half 15, two blade, Mankins. <laughs> You know, steel. And, um, yeah, you 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 still using all Mankins? Yes, with with Brian at Bergeron and stuff. You know, he's he, he's still very good. A lot of people go, oh, you know, Bergeron. You know what? He, Brian's not like Phil, but he he is a wealth of knowledge and know how to get a lot of parts. You know, yeah. the the one thing we do buy from him is our turnbuckles. Uh, we buy our prop shafts from him. We buy our turnbuckles from him. Our rudders come from him. Uh, Strut-wise, we're getting to a point where we're going to have to start building our own struts because nobody wants to build them, and there's a whole lot that goes into building a strut. People go, oh, you just take the barrel, you weld it on here, and, oh, it's going good. There's a huge amount of heat treat that you got to know, the mm. process of welding the blade onto the barrel. Um, the last thing you're doing it is gun drilling it you know, for the bearings to fit. You got to mm -hmm, make sure mm -hmm. the barrel doesn't have warp it. I mean, there's a whole thing that that when Phil was around, he would we were going through all this stuff and, and learning. So you break a strut, you broke the boat. You know, you, you're done. So getting back to people coming into the shop now, we build what everybody, what a customer wants and, and do. Now, in the meantime, we came up with the 32 foot boat. The boat was CNC cut from Janicky up in north, up north. In other words, we took a boat, a plug. We ran it, we ran it, we changed strakes on it, we did everything. Took it to a computer company, back to the modern day boats. Um, took it to a computer company, had it scanned. So they scanned one side of the boat, they mirror image it to the other one, clean up all the lines, and we sent it to a company called Janicky up in Washington. They build an A-frame out of a bunch of A-frames on a pallet, a level pallet, and they shoot it with 22 pound foam. So you look at this thing, it looks like something out of Disneyland or the movies. This is a big old block of foam that they, they spray on it. Well, they have a five-point axis CNC machine that comes out of the ceiling. You're in a building that's 100 yards long. And the CNC machine's on track, so it goes back and forth. And for 24 hours, it just starts cutting the boat. So you get a male. You, 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 get, you could do the boat molds two ways. You could do a female out of it. They could do a female. Uh, if they do a female mold, um, you get about three boats out of it before the mold starts coming apart. If oh, no way. It comes out to a full-on plug. So you do a male, same thing. They shoot it with tooling gel coat. They block sand it. They get it close, and then they ship it down on back of a semi down to you. So the modern way um, is you get your plug work right away. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we do that, the public doesn't even know. Not you know the majority of the public doesn't know. So we do a thirty-two foot boat. Um, not very many of them. I don't enjoy building them. Um, I'm not into that cookie cutter boat. I do build them. I do get into it when when the customer, mm -hmm. depending on what we do. Uh, we also build a forty-three foot boat. We've done a couple of those. Forty-three runs really good. Now, my opinion, I think boat for boat, we probably have the fastest forty-three bottom. Really. In the country. Huh. But we don't market it. Um, we had, uh, 700s in the last one we did. We put Merc 700s in it. The boat ran 93 miles an hour with wow, 700 full on wow. galley generators mm -hmm. to, you know, ahead. Uh, it had a, a hot top stove, electric stove in it. It had a refrigerator in it, two air conditioners. It had four TVs in it. Um, uh, I mean, it was a heavy boat and it still mm -hmm. ran you know, in the low 90s with 700s. And and I know with 1550s in it with number eight drives, that boat would run over 125 miles an hour, no problem. Yeah. You, met, you mentioned marketing. 
So mm-hmm. I'm assuming at this point in your lifetime at Chada, uh, they kind of sell themselves. Uh, they do. I, I don't imagine you do a lot of marketing. At, at, we, at what at kind of at what point did you, at what point in the lifetime of the business did it get to that point where you're like, because I, I remember the days, there was years when it was a struggle and you guys were doing a lot it, of marketing and a lot of, you know. It was after, when I came back, we did a little bit of marketing. And, and at that time, we still had the LA Boat Show. SCMA had the LA Boat Show. And we went into the LA Boat Show and... We never sold anything at the LA Boat Show. Nothing. Never. Because of the fact that we we you couldn't get your boat in time. You know, you you were gonna order your boat and was gonna you were gonna get it, you know, nine months, twelve months, eighteen months later. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, mm-hmm. turnkey operation eighteen months. From start to finish. If we we're to work on it full time, about eighteen months. People go, Oh, you're nuts, I'm not waiting that long. Which, you know, if you're you're a compulsive buyer, it's probably not the boat for you. Um, well, and if, and if you're, if you're buying a cut, I mean, I, I've been in the hot rod industry for the last 20 mm-hmm. years. And I mean, if you're a custom anything guy, I mean, they take yeah. time. There's no way you can get a custom bike, car, motorhome, anything. Yeah. It's going to take time. It's just, that's yeah. just life. And if a, if a guy can't appreciate it, it probably doesn't want to buy a custom. This customer comes in and says, how much? I said, I don't know. You want it? And then, yeah, I want it. Okay. Then right. it is what it is. You know, right. um, not trying to be bad on that stance, but, no, you know, but always, it, customers and I have a good time doing that. I'm not going to yeah, insult I mean, the customer, but, you know. But, again, again the, it's, it's like buying a Porsche, right? The guy knows what he's going to get. He yes. knows what he's going to get. You're going to get the... It, it, you're going to be happy when you get it. And, and if you're not happy, I'm going to do everything I can, you know, to make you happy and, and, and do stuff. You know, by the way, it's kind of odd when you buy something and you put all the best of everything in it. You're usually pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. They are, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I like working with the customers. I like them coming in and, and being part of it um, and, and seeing how it goes together and, and how many parts go into it. Like we were saying earlier, you do a V-Drive boat. You know, there's, there's 200, 300, 400 parts on a V-Drive boat. Um, and people go, what do you mean? You know, you got upper steering support, rudder port, strut, prop shaft, you know, couplers. You're building your own motor rails, your backup bars, your cab assemblies, your transmission supports, your trans, uh, your V-drive supports, your V-drives, uh, V-drive angles. You know, you're building all this stuff, and, and you lay it out on a bench, and you look at it. And Carson and I were laughing one day because I had one V-drive boat laid out on a bench. And I'm like, I don't have any more room to put on this bench, this 8 by 10 bench. I have no, you know there's no more room right. on it and right. Right. i'm looking over at the outdrive boat and there's two motor angles two motor mount angles. yeah exactly that's it. The, like, that you pull that that you well everybody else i was gonna say that you would pull off a shelf and yeah basically in, right? i took out a half inch material and you put them you cut yeah. a hole you bolt the motor in you, yeah. you build it and you go wow it's very hard to make a custom outdrive boat you know because you go oh i got 10 parts right. in an outdrive right. and i right. got 250 300 parts in a v-drive that right. are hand built right. Um, and yeah, modify to make it work. Yeah, that's, that's, so that's, that's, there's there's a lot of people go, oh, especially outboards are worse now. You have no parts on an outboard. Oh my gosh. They're which which is yeah. why that's all anybody wants to build now, right? Yeah. And, and you know, the out, outboards, I'm, I'm doing two of, two of them right now. And I get, Mercruiser took absolutely the easiest thing to build. A 2.5 where you had a wiring harness and a fuel line and battery cables. To build a boat. Now, uh-huh. you know, they got 10 different types of wiring harnesses. You can't use oh, the same it? wiring harness you use on a, a on a 300R, on a 400R. They're totally different. Really? So if you buy a 300R and you go, you know what, this boat's really not fast enough. I want a 500. You might as well build a new boat because you're, re, you're, you're tearing it down to a bare hull. Oh, no because kidding. nothing works. Oh, None of the gosh. wiring harnesses work. Nothing works. And you go, why did they do this? No clue. You know? So... I like my V drive world. My V drive world, I control. I like cables. I don't like fly by wire stuff. Um, people go, well, you fly in an airplane. Is, and I'm like, well, not really, because I'm scared to death to flying. You know, even even though I do fly and 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 we have to go places, I know what goes into an airplane and and you know and, and what type of people build airplanes. And you go, oh my god, 
you know. Um, <laughs> well, but it, you know, it, it's kind of like I was listening to some guys today talk about muscle cars. It's kind of the same feel, right? You feel the torque. You, you, I mean, you know what? The, all the the harmonics and the vibration that led the industry away from V drives. Yes. You still, it's awesome, and you still want it. And there's still guys that want to deal with it, and the leaks yeah. and the grease and the whatever. But it's it's it, 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 you know, it's still it is what it is. And if if that's what you want, I mean, it, you, there's no substitute. It's really cool. We developed a cult following, and we started doing a couple of regattas and stuff. And we have this cult following that just loves our stuff. And and it's just not in California. People go, oh, I got boats in Texas. I got, you know, in Wisconsin. We got them Florida, New York. We got them everywhere. And mm-hmm. what it is, is it's guys that are my age and your age, Joe, that in high school, when we went to high school, we had that Camaro, or we had that Nova, or we had that Chevelle, and we cruised. We cruised the Volvo, some with blown motors, some with carbureted hot rods, and we would go to the track, or we would street race. We'd do whatever we had to play with these cars. All my customers that I have now are going through that childhood. Oh, I mm-hmm. had a cruise car in high school, and now I want something special. So what we... What really comes around, our cult following and our older guys, like myself, in our 60s, um, that like to go out and we hot rod in the morning or we go for a cruise, we put the wife in the boat and, and the kids, and we head up to the, you know, foxes for breakfast or, or used to be bad knocks, you know, <laughs> and, and yeah. uh, Roadrunner or, or Pirates or wherever you're going, we go have breakfast And then we come home and the boat gets tied up and we get the pontoon boat out, you know, and (laughs) we take the barbecue and, uh, you know, I got an Avalon that I have up at the lake as well. And that comes out and I go, oh, who goes, who wants to go for a boat ride? Everybody jumps in the Avalon. Um, Everybody jumps in the pontoon boat. Nobody jumps in the 21. And you go, right, right. You know, what's wrong with this? Oh, that's too rough out there. I don't, I I want to go out with all, we want to go out and and have a cocktail, you know, it's the wine hour, you know, where, you know, everybody jumps in with, you know, Passover, they're very into wine drinking. So we get the wine drinking crew, but that's what ended, that's what ended our, our advertisement. The last thing we did was the Miami boat show. We built a a boat for one of the Royal family members in, in the middle East. We took, it was a 43, um, and we took that boat back and, and that was a really, that was, that was really neat experience. The boat was absolutely fantastic. Um, it, it showed that, yeah, the, the things that I could build could keep up with the East coast stuff. Um, when you guys got like the owner of cigarette coming over and going, Hey, I want to talk to you, you know, and, and just kind yeah. of seeing who you are, who's the new kid, which, you know, I'm a lot right, older than right. being a kid, but, um, you know, you go back there and you see how boats are built and, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of things out here that um, you get, I could say jaded, where you get into your own little world, but you really got to get out and look at everybody's stuff. I mean, everybody's, everybody, a lot of people build nice stuff, and I like it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of the people that you've interviewed, absolutely incredible builds and stuff. Finnegan, you know, really, really cool stuff that he does. Um, he's in his own deal. Um, uh he, it's it's a lot of fun. People don't see me because I don't go out. I don't go out to the river that much. I don't go to Havasu that much. You'll see me on some of the things. If we go out to Desert Storm, you'll see me. I'm really the guy behind the scenes. Everybody go. Oh, everybody goes. Oh, Lee. Oh, Lee. You know, I'll be standing there, and it's kind of nice. You go into a bar, and somebody's talking, talking, and you you know you're kind of eavesdropping. They don't know who you are. They don't know what you yeah. built. You know, they don't know. You know, so it, it's kind of interesting when you when you hear things like that. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the guys that know they 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 know the guys that and, yeah. and you've got a you've got a hardcore following. I mean, again, well, these, these guys they they know what they know what you guys do. They know the boats. I mean, it's pretty it's, crazy it's, how 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 well versed they are on the. In fact, that's why a lot of this stuff people are gonna really. It's gonna be very cool to hear hear some of this inside stuff because there's because a lot of shot of fans, man. One of my one of my my best friends. A guy named Mike Stapleton, he comes and works with me. Um, he's He was off-roading. When you go to off-road, uh, the off-road world, 
Uh, he was score crew chief of the year three times. I mean, he's way yeah. up in the off-roading world. Um, numerous championships, Baja 1500, San Felipe, um, won them over time and time again with cars that he built. And, and I took him out in a 21 one time. And first, he put me in a class one car. So with one of my customers, Randy Wilson, and, and took me out in a class one car, and it was like, I got out of the car and you had that adrenaline rush. It's like the first time I haven't had that rush since the first time I ran in a turbocharged 21 and I get out of the car and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm shaking. You know, this is incredible. You know, got me into the off-road world, got me, you know, racing with the Wilsons, uh, Wilson Motorsports. And, and then it was my turn. I got Mike into a 21 V drive and took him for a ride. And we stopped down by blue water. I ran him from, I think it was foxes all the way down to, to blue water on it. You know, we're, you know, cruising 105, 110 down the, down the deal the whole way. I mean, that's a long stretch and we stop and he gets out, sits on the deck, gets out of the seat. He sits on the deck and I'm like, man, you okay? And he's like, I'm shaking. And it's (laughs) the adrenaline rush. You know, that's what I want to do with people. Um, that's the feeling I want when people get out and go, Oh my God, yeah. I can't believe yeah. this piece of machinery. You know, I've been, I've been in this business for over 43, about 43 years, 44 years now, you know, specializing in V drives. I'm always willing to help people out and if they have questions and answers and, and stuff. I, like I said, I don't do flat bottoms. There's guys that are better than me in flat bottoms. There's guys that are better than me in jets. I do V drive cruisers. I'm a cruiser guy. So a little bit different ball game. I don't do tournament boats and I hate wakeboard boats um, (laughs) with a passion. A wakeboard boat will crash. It will start crashing boats here pretty soon. You're going to get a boat coming around the corner. Oh, I think, I think, I think they already do. It's going to be done. So being that, being that you're the behind the scenes guy, one question I always like to ask is what's, what's something about yourself that people would really find interesting or want to ask more question about? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, it's any hobbies. I I long range fish. I my my thing is I'm chasing that 300 pound tuna, yellowfin tuna, not the bluefin tuna we get off the coast. I'm chasing yellowfin. Um, I've got to fish with with the guys from Wicked Tuna. Um, I've done work with them. I get to fish with them. Um, monster fish. Um, I like my thing. It's I'm a trophy hunter when it comes to fishing. I don't want little fish. I, I, I go on boats for 15 to 18 days. You know, we're, we're 1200 miles down, 550 miles out for, for 10 days, five days of travel. You know, that is, that's, that's my deal. My second is, is off-road racing. Um, being with the Wilsons, uh, it's such a family orientated race team uh they didn't have good luck they just ran the 500 i did not go down i'm actually recovering from surgery so i didn't get to go this time but i usually go down to mexico with the guys um with mike and everybody um they didn't have really good luck this race they had some mechanical mechanical issues they run two class one cars and they're state-of-the-art class one cars Hmm. um which you think boat boating is expensive try building a class one car you yeah, know, that's yeah. that's twice of what a boat is um running with the trophy trucks and stuff um you know with 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 robbie and things knowing who you know there's a lot of mutual expect respect between the offshore or the off-road world and the and and us a lot of those guys own our stuff so mm-hmm. it's kind of neat to go out there and and, and do things um the thing I, I really enjoy in this business is I've gotten to work with some of the best people in the world when it comes down. Getting to work with guys like you, I've got to work with you, um, knowing, knowing you since Rex Marine back in, in the early 80s and, and then Eddie Marine and doing all this stuff, uh, knowing you for forever. It's been, you know, a, it's a priceless friendship. Um, getting to work with guys like Bob Teague. Uh, where people don't understand sometimes about him, um, you know, but working with Bob and Norm Teague, uh, getting to work with Carson Brummett, a guy named Andy Myers, you know, just guys that I do work with, you know, Mike Stapleton, guys like that. 
Andy Casale, uh, meeting guys when they were alive, Jim Cole when he was in his in his prime doing drag boat stuff and, and seeing what they do. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, there's guys in here that, you know, they all have really good, you know, aspects of, of building boats and what they think. So it, it's a generation that's going to be lost, I think, uh, when it comes to the performance world. I, I, I consider myself a dinosaur. Um, nobody wants to step up. We're talking about young guys. I'm to the age, least to the age where, you know, in five to seven years, I want to be done. Um, I, I don't want to quit building boats, but I want to be done doing what I'm doing where we have so many lined up. Uh, but I can't get anybody to come in. I can't get, you know, I would turn around and be happy to, you know, pay and teach somebody the business um, and come in and want to put some time in and learn and do it my way. Uh we can't find anybody anymore. You know, it, it, so, you know, will this company die away? No, we want to sell it, you know, um, in the future. But if somebody walks in in five years and says, hey, I want to buy it, but I need you to stick around for a couple of years, I don't know if that's going to happen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. it, it's a tough oh. thing. It's a thing that you have to like it. You, you, you're not going to make, you know. Leonard always said there to everybody, you, you know, one week you're eating feathers, next week you might have some chicken. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's feast or famine sometimes. Yeah. You know? Well, it's it's and again going back to what I asked you about the marketing in three years, and I've, I've, you know, I know there are tough times. It's it's really nice to see where you guys have gotten in the last few years to yeah. where you don't have to, you know, the, the people appreciate it. you can charge what you want, stay true to your mission, your motto, yeah. and your and you know we're gonna build it right and. And it, it is cool. I mean, obviously this stuff's extremely expensive, but um, there is obviously a clientele to afford it. And for the people that can't afford it, people appreciate it. And it's it's cool to see. And uh, so so I'm glad you guys have gotten to that to that point. And, uh, and yeah, we'll put this out there. So be ready for the phone calls for those apprentices. Um, on, that, know, on that note, how, how, do, how do people find you? What's, okay. Uh, uh, we have our, our best way is, is, just basically calling us. I always have my phone on. I, I don't want to take calls at, you know, eight, nine o'clock at night. You know, you can email me as well. And I'll give you that out. Shiada, S-C-H-I-A-D-A, Stan, S-T-A-N at AOL.com. If you also email shiadaboats.com at AOL.com, um, that goes into Lee's computer. Uh, He's not the fastest. I know we're losing light in here. I should turn on the office lights so you can see me because I'm, I'm looking. At <laughs> You've been I'm slowly. That's dark. okay. Most people uh, listen to this. They don't watch any. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you know, through the phone numbers, ask around. That's our best way of, of getting in touch. Good for you guys for all those years of, of uh, you know, walking the walk and doing it the right way. So, Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. What else I want to do is I want you to come down. See what we're building. The shop's always a mess. Awesome. Um, we always got stuff going, and we're, you know, you, you just, it's never organized. I'm, I'm always a little nervous when I go in the shops and they're not a mess. It's like, but, you got a lot of time on your hand here. Yeah, yeah, you know, but <laughs> so. come on in. We'll, All right. We, we got a couple cool Teague products there right now with Teague Motors in it. We got a couple Carson Motors going in, and, and you'll look back and you'll see why this stuff costs so much and, and what wow. we do. You know, no question. No question. All right. So. All right, man. Well, thank you very much. That was awesome. That's, thank you. We got a lot. That's cool. People are going to love uh, it. Yeah, it's probably we ran over our time limit, but it's all right. Hopefully we, it works it, for you. It, as it goes, it goes, you know, we, get, we want, may only get one time to do this. So we want to make sure it's good and it's right. So, you, you know, and I, I put it out to people, if they want to see what I build in, in, in they're in Van Nuys, I, I, there's a lot of times I, I tell people, hey, I can't have you come in right now um, because we're just trying to get stuff done. But, you know, if they're really boating guys and, and they they need something, you know, I'm always there. Always there yeah. for them. So. Awesome. All right. You take care. All right. All thanks right. again, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, buddy. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Power Boat Talk. If you like what you've heard, please head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more Powerboat Talk, follow us on Facebook or Instagram, or visit our website at powerboattalk.com.